Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips where we will dive right into the continuing saga excerpts from whole Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. I thought of a lot of questions I want to ask Dr. Campbell and I'm so glad he's going to be here in November. We'll all have that opportunity because he's going to give lectures based on this book. So we were talking about the subtle power uh, on Tuesday that's exerted by agricultural organizations, large food manufacturing companies, drug and device makers, the medical profession. Um, but why does the scientific community go along with this? I mean, I, you know, there, I'm sure everybody has asked themselves at some point in time, why not just have some giant revolt that changes everything? Well. Um, the problem is that today, if you look at research, we judge, when I say we, the community at large, judges the quality of research by how precise it is. Instead of investigating whole systems, research focuses on tiny details. It's again that reductionist approach to um, health that is described throughout the book. The research is directed toward developing products and services instead of the search for unbiased truth and a willingness to be proven wrong. DNA and cellular metabolism are interesting to researchers, while human well-being and long-term studies on the overall state of health are just a little too fuzzy for the research community. The structure of research studies, therefore, perpetuates reductionism. Funding is granted to those who propose focused research designed to study detailed biological effects of single nutrients rather than food and looking for single biological mechanisms to explain effects rather than looking at the interaction of several potential mechanisms. And given the complexity of the human body and how food and the environment and our genes and everything interact to create health or disease, it almost is ludicrous to think about studying individual nutrients with individual biological mechanisms mechanisms, but applicants have to stay within this paradigm where they won't get funded, and then this threatens their careers and the financial health of the institutions and universities that house them. The book describes in some detail how funding can skew research results. Studies show that researchers change study design in response to funding sources, and they are more inclined to do this type of thing the longer they're involved in research. 12.5% of researchers surveyed state that they overlook flaws in other researchers' findings in order to continue a particular line of research. So why don't researchers who know better do better? Well, Campbell's experience is a good example of the reason why. A member of a panel charged with reviewing Campbell's application to renew funding for the China Project told him that his application came, quote, perilously close to a description of a holistic research strategy and that he should never again include this in future documents if he expected to get funding. Well, Campbell's answer at the end of the day was to withdraw from the system rather than comply, but most scientists aren't in a position to do that. Additional co-conspirators and conspirators in the status quo are peer reviewers. While the peer review system is supposed to protect us against bad research, it actually protects us against learning much of anything that's new. Reviewers bring their own biases to the table. They decide in advance that certain types of research are not appropriate and that certain study designs won't be approved at all. Peer review can stifle scientific exploration and creativity and today it actually helps perpetuate our reductionist view of the world. Additionally, drug companies advertise in the publications in which research is published and um, the, these journals publish the results of research on these people's products. Drug companies can order glossy reprints of articles favoring their products which helps them in their marketing efforts and creates huge profits for the journals. The journals really can't afford to upset the apple cart with the drug companies. This gives journals an incentive to publish articles focusing on benefits from products like drugs, more reductionism. Campbell describes his own difficulty in getting his papers published due to his refusal to write within the reductionist paradigm. The mainstream media, not much better, and I don't think many of you are surprised to hear that. They have to answer to advertisers and industries and different industry in different ways than peer review journals and the medical profession, but the result's the same. Journalists who write about health, their bosses, often know even less than those involved in publishing medical research. They just report the information that they're given. And drug and device makers generally get more attention than findings from projects like the China Project. Um, there's no advertising benefit to reporting on the pro China Project like there is to reporting about drugs. Even the public broadcasting system, PBS, partially funded by taxpayers, is not exempt from this entire system and all of the things that are wrong with it. 
So um, once again, by the time we're finished with this series, which will be next week, I promise I'll tell you some things that are hopeful. I mean, it's easy to listen to this and think, my gosh, is there any hope that we'll survive and, and come out of this with a different way of thinking about things than there actually is? Uh, but um, it's important to understand how we got to the place that we are and what keeps us locked in this whole system of inaccurate information and bad choices as it pertains to diet and health. So um, I'll stop there. We'll continue this and finish it up next week. Once again, the book is whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. I really suggest that you read the whole thing, but you'll have enough after you uh, listen to all of this. You'll get the general idea. And this article will be posted uh, on the um, Health Breeze Online Library site uh, next week. That's all for now. Have a great day and weekend, and I will speak to you again on Tuesday.